Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Phil. Uh, yep. uh, Greg Johnson. Here. Mary. Here. Is Alexis here? Yep, yeah, yeah. I just I logged in. Uh, oh, okay. good. We were worried about you tonight. Brian. Sorry. Here. Thank you. Mike Stevens. Yes. Thank you. Cameron Linquist. I don't see her on yet. Jennifer. Yes. Thank you. Wayne. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, yes. Mark Anderson. Yes. Thank you. Anthony. Let's see. Matthew. Yes. Thank you. Nick, not here. Ken's not here. Josh. Yes. That's it for the voting members. We have a quorum. Uh, first thing on the agenda would be to read the governor's little notes. Pursuant to Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, signed into law by Governor Healy on March 29, 2023, several pandemic-related relief provisions suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, GLC 30A, Section 20, were further extended until March 31st, 2025. All members of the public are invited to join the meeting virtually, either by computer or on phone as noted. If joining virtually, video and audio will be turned off for all public participants unless otherwise stipulated by the chair. There will be time for questions from the public at the end of the formal meeting. If a member of the public wishes to speak, please raise your hand in the meeting room Oh, you're not in a meeting room or on the computer. Uh, when you're called upon, please state your name for the meeting minutes. That does it. Next item on the agenda is approval of prior meeting minutes. Uh, the prior meeting minutes were from uh, July 29th. Yep, the 29th. Uh, has everybody, you should have received them a couple of times. Once I think Brady sent them out and they had the PowerPoint and everything attached to them. And just yesterday I sent them out without the PowerPoint. Has, does anybody have any burning issues with the, uh, uh, you know, not punctuation and grammar or things of that nature, but any reason we need to amend these minutes before we vote for approval? I'm not seeing or hearing anybody scream via roll call. I'm going to uh, uh, look for approval of the meeting minutes from the July 29th, 2024 meeting. Justin. Yay. Greg. Yes. Mary. Yes. Alexis. Yes. Brian. Yes. Mike Stevens. Yes. Is Karen here yet? Yes. Okay, thank you. Jennifer. Yes. Wayne. Yes. Uh, I mean, yes. Mark Anderson. Yes. Anthony here yet? Yeah, I'm here. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you, Anthony. Matthew. Yes. Nick, no, Ken, no. Josh. Yes. Okay, that's all the voting members. Minutes of the past. Uh, Phil, you own it now. All right, thank you guys. Um, next agenda item is schedule update. So on the slide is a more macro schedule uh, perspective from now till the end of design. So when we last met with you guys on July 29th, we got your approval to submit the 60% uh, construction document submission to MSBA. So that uh, got submitted to them the very next day. Uh, since then we got their 60% um, CD design review. Um, we got it last Wednesday. So we have till Wednesday of next week to get them uh, responses, uh, minor minor items, so all good there. Uh, but look ahead wise, we have uh, the same process happening in terms of the 90% construction document module. Um, so seeking your approval for that submission on October 28th, um, looking to have the permitting process. So planning board and conservation commission, um, hoping to have that process wrapped up by the end of September. And then uh, we'll start the contract of prequal process mid-October, and that will go up until the end of November. 
uh, with the bid set complete for early December and have the bidding process go from that point early December through January. And that ESP, that stands for early site package, the kind of the end completion date for that early site package is the end of January of next year. And then for a more uh, zoomed in schedule outlook in terms of the 90%, well, wrapping up the 60% CD module. So we got MSBA's review and we'll, um, we'll get them responses to their design review comments uh, by next Wednesday of next week. And, but we're still kind of just moving along into the 90% CD module. We have October 2nd as the target date to get the cost estimators, the um, cost estimate set. They'll have a couple of weeks to put together uh, their unreconciled cost estimates. And we'll meet with them on October 21st to have the 90% uh, CD estimate reconciliation meeting and then uh, put those numbers together, get that document over to you guys and prep for our meeting on October 28th to seek your approval to submit that 90% CD package to MSBA, just like we did at the last meeting for the 60% CD submission. Um, so we'll submit that to MSB on October 29th. They'll take a few weeks to review and put together a design review list. Um, and we'll spend a couple weeks after that incorporating those or responding to them as well as incorporating any changes into the bid set, uh, targeting that December 4th uh, bid completion, bid set completion uh, to go live with the bid set. Any questions on any of that schedule update? Okay. Next agenda item project budget update. So since we last met uh, four weeks ago, these are all the invoices that have been plugged into the financials. So we have Collier's July invoice uh, in the amount of that 37.4K. AM Fogarty, they're the owner cost estimator. So this invoice uh, 17.5K is for that 60% CD uh, estimate reconciliation effort. Um, Green International Affiliates, they're the peer reviewer for both the Planning Board and Conservation Commission. Um, so this invoice in the amount of 5975 that's their first billing for the hours spent on the Planning Board peer review. There will be, there'll be some more invoices coming from them uh, for their peer review, but that's the first um, invoice. Uh, MVG's August invoice in the amount of the 334500 um, MVG's uh, billing for uh, the playground move effort. They had um, uh, a proposed amount in that Amendment 5. We executed with them in the amount of $6,000. So that's been billed to uh, DM Berg. They were the approved structural peer reviewer for the structural peer process. Uh, they performed their structural um, peer review uh, that was put together and uh, made part of the 60% CD submission to MSBA. So they billed for that effort, the $3,500. Uh, Lord Environmental, uh, we um, included a scope of theirs in our amendment with uh, Mount Vernon Group Amendment Number 5 for some additional environmental testing of soils. Uh, so that's at $88. And then UEC, um, that is MVG's hazmat consultant, and for the additional hazmat sampling and testing that was done um, that's at 15950 So grand total since we last met with you all, $420,981.19. And in terms of total project budget, I'm highlighting the budget line items that were affected by those buildings. So you have the OPM budget line item here. Advertising part of, part of Collier's July invoice was the advertising uh, needed to advertise for the early site package bidding. So that's that kind of approximately $700 there. Permitting, so that's that peer review for the planning board process. Architect and engineering, that's um, MVG's July billing or August billing. Other AE costs, so that is for um, MVG's billing for that playground move. And then within this hazmat budget line item is the environmental testing agency, um, company as well as UEC, the hazmat consultant. So grand total is still that $83.6 million total project budget and paid to date has gone up to the $4,081,000. Um, and then total contracted to date is that $14,675,000. Any questions on budget update? Okay. Next agenda item was early site package update. So the grayed out 
bullet bullet points here kind of have happened since we last uh, before we met with you last. So we kind of grade them out. So since we last met with you on July 29th, we had uh, the pre-con kickoff meeting at the school. So that had the school district staff there. Um, it had police chief, fire chief there. Uh, Justin was there, Collier's MVG, MVG's um, geotech consultant was there as well as well uh, consultant was there. And um, of course the contractor was there. It was a great kickoff meeting, um, had a sit down portion of it and then walked the site. Um, this week is is the week where they're going to start to mobilize to do um, kind of set up the construction zone, if you will. So temp fencing, jersey barriers, et cetera, around the building. And then we're starting our weekly OAC meeting. So owner, architect, contractor meetings will start those next Wednesday. And this slide here shows uh, the three week look ahead that the contractor has been putting together. Um, so previous two weeks here, kind of these grayed out columns just shows what they did. So they they went through the dig safe process to get some um, locations on underground utilities, et cetera. Got the process going with um, electrical service for the office trailer. And I'll in the upcoming slides, I'll show where that's going to be located. Um, and so all that effort there with coordinating with Eversource and whatnot for that electrical service. And then kind of for the next three weeks, so I talked about this week in terms of erosion control and um, temp fencing and whatnot around the building. So that'll get going. Um, we have, they're showing here, we have a con con meeting this Friday night and Chris and I will get into the details on that, but but that con, the result of that con con meeting will will trigger us to be able to start doing some real um, site prep work that we want to get going. So clearing any trees that need to be cleared, topsoil, ledge, et cetera, stuff like that. Uh, we've been kind of holding off on land disturbing activities until we have that CONCOM approval. So that's scheduled for Friday night. Uh, but on Friday, um, while folks are off, uh, staff and students, there are gonna be some test pits done, minor test pits, um, over at kind of the entry point, and I'll point it out on the next slide of this early site package construction zone to get a solid understanding as to where these underground utilities really are. So we got water, we got gas, we got electric. We we got them shown on the site survey, but to really nail down exactly where they are so we don't disturb them. And then just showing once we get that CONCOM approval or hopefully get that CONCOM approval on Friday night, so the, the site prep work happening, so site clearing, um, stripping topsoil, et cetera, um, getting some trees cleared. And once once the trees are cleared, the fencing kind of in the back, if you will, the construction zone, that's when that can get installed and kind of really wrap around and create a, a full perimeter of a construction zone. And then at the end of um, a couple of weeks from now, showing, um, starting the probe for the ledge and, and whatnot to prep for the ledge blasting. Uh, any questions on on that schedule update for early site package scope? And Karen, I'm sorry about kind of the bobbin and weaving. I know we were hoping to have fencing done last week. Um, you have your hand raised. I just had a question. So when I look at the the blasting in the next three weeks, do you? We don't have attached dates to that. It really depends on all the approvals that are impending. Yeah, so so blasting isn't so when I say uh, ledge probing, that is not the blasting. So the blasting is going to ha happen outbound of this. Um, but the goal would be for maybe the first sessions of blasting to happen towards the end of September. But as soon as we know, I'll let you know. And I know we want to get some notifications out to abutters, and we want to set up with you and maybe uh, do something with the students or whatnot. So. Perfect. That sounds great. And you know what? I mean, the Jersey barriers were set up today, so at least there's a visual for people. Yeah. That's okay. Awesome. Perfect. At least it yep. shows them why we're making the changes that we're making. There's right. Yeah. Thanks. Perfect. Any other questions? Okay. So these next couple of slides, so they had to submit a construction logistics plan. So, of course, in the bid docs, we provide a, an overall construction plan, if you will. Uh, but they're required for the bid docs to put together their own kind of site logistics plan to show us how they plan to take ownership of, of this early site package and keep it safe and whatnot. So, 
Um, one of the changes that came out of our pre-con meeting and the, and the walkthrough after it, we walked the entry point. So this is the entry point to the, what is the early site package, if you will. The idea was this was going to be set up um, as a gravel entry point for contractors to come in and, and be within the construction zone at this point. And when we walked this area after the pre-con meeting, uh, we realized, oh boy, we got the sidewalk that uh, parents and students use to go from parking lot here by Crow Park uh, to escort their kids to the school. So what do we do? So um, the plan is to have, so in the bid docs, we were showing kind of the fencing kind of taking up all that area up until kind of the, the curb line, if you will. So the change there is um, not do that and have the fence essentially wrap um, shy of the sidewalk so that the construction project is not disturbing that sidewalk and parents and students can continue in a safe manner to walk from this parking lot to the front entry. So that's one change to point out. Uh, this square here is the parking lot that is south of of the staff and parent parking lot by Crow Park. It's currently kind of barriered off and not used. The plan is to have the office trailer there and um, come from that lot, the back corner of that lot through um, and have an entry point here to the construction zone. So we are not bothering uh, parents and students and teachers uh, coming down the sidewalk. Um, this was walked with Justin um, so, and, and actually, as it stands right now, it's there's a, a pretty wide path there right now. There may just need to be one tree removed, um, but it's actually pretty wide right now. So that's the current plan as it relates to entering into this uh, construction zone to help not conflict with school use. And then the back portion of the construction zone, no changes there. Um, still kind of that wrapped around construction fencing around where the new buildings proposed to be in the well field and kind of connected to the existing building here. One, well, actually, one more thing I'll highlight when, when we were walking this whole property, um, with everybody at the pre-con meeting and, and talking with the fire chief and Karen, we talked about, um, this is a better look, uh, an egress in, in, in the event, in the event of, um, egresses for fire evacuation, Students and staff that have these back classrooms that have egress doors that go head right outside um, before this construction project, they would just use those doors and head out. But now because they would be heading out into a construction zone uh, and stepping uh, the floor plan through with the fire chief and with Karen, we said, OK, can we have um, this wing of students and um, staff exit out this egress here? And then from this portion up, egress out the back corner there. So that's the plan of attack for uh, kind of a change in, in egress pattern for to accommodate that. Any questions on any of that? Karen? <laughs> so I just want to clarify, now the, the construction vehicles are actually going to follow the tan path sort of from that Crow Park area that's not used for parking but the jersey barriers are still going up like they they outline the magenta pathway as of this afternoon yeah okay so fencing is still along the magenta pathway but vehicles won't be entering unless they need to correct yeah area. perfect i just yeah. want to make sure i'm communicating the right language yeah yeah, the only change with construction fencing is literally instead of bringing it all the way here, it's it's cutting it short so we're not messing with the sidewalk here. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yep. Any other questions, comments? Okay. So, uh, so far, so good with the early site package. Um, so planning board and con con permitting update. So we had, since we last met with you all, we had our first hearing for planning board and con con. Uh, both went as you would expect for a first hearing. You you, you never kind of close out at the first hearing. So um, good discussions, but ultimately, you know, a second hearing will be required. So um, we did have our second hearing for planning board scheduled for tomorrow night. That has since been pushed because uh, the peer reviewer got 
um, got some initial responses to their design review comments um, in a timely manner. We got them to them last week, but then uh, we got some additional comments after that that we responded to promptly, but it was a little too close for comfort uh, for tomorrow night. So um, we're going to continue the planning board hearing uh, to September 10th. So that'll be when that gets picked back up. And um, in terms of the next hearing for CONCOM, that was always going to be September 10th. This date here uh, is the, the, the meeting that I was talking about when I was going through uh, the contractor's three-week look ahead. It is a, a meeting where we're going to seek a, a waiver for a town bylaw. Uh, we're going to seek it with CONCOM. And Chris, if you want to kind of give them an understanding as to what that is for. Yeah, so um, this Friday's meeting, CONCOM requires a stormwater permit for the project, just as any um, large project would be required by the state and local communities. One of the things that the town of Maynard has in their bylaws is if there's any disturbance uh, of, I think, 10,000 square feet or more, you also require a stormwater permit, which in in this case triggers the need for even to do just the prep work of the early site package tree clearing some some ledge removal blasting uh bringing in fill and compacting it so in in understanding that um the only way around that would be to request a rate a waiver for the stormwater permit for just this portion of work we are still have the application and information in for the main project uh, and in doing so, you know, they tried to get a meeting scheduled maybe, I think it was a week ago or even for this week, but if they couldn't advertise in time. So now we have a special meeting for Friday. And my understanding is it's it's primarily a formality. We've met with uh, the town's consultant who's kind of standing in for Julia, the, the Conservation Administration. Um, so this should be, uh, this should go well Friday. I'm sure nobody wants to make it a long meeting. We'll get this approved for the waiver. Um, that will, as Phil mentioned earlier, get the contractor moving to start all of their disturbance, tree clearing, ledge removal, et cetera. And then, then we're off to the races. We will, uh, as part of the Conservation Commission process, uh, meet with them to get the stormwater permit application approved for the overall project so that when the contract is ready to start building in the spring, uh, we're good to go with that. So that'll include all the development. Thanks, Chris. Uh, any questions on any of that permitting update? I just, um, it, while you're meeting with them, Chris, if you could, at the, I'm very impressed that the Conservation Commission is going to, you know, take time um, before, right before Labor Day to meet with you guys. So appreciate their urgency. Um, if you want to yeah. share that with them. <laughs> we will. Yeah, agreed, Mary. Agreed. Okay. So next agenda item was to go through, uh, you know, review and vote on value engineering and add alternate scopes. So the first couple slides here I have is kind of where the the decisions were left when we last met with you all. So this slide here shows the three add alternates that we had been carrying for a while. We had our last meeting a month ago and we said, okay, add alternate number, number one, add pickleball court, Let's strike that out of the project. So that's stricken out. Add alternate number two, add structure for future PV canopy. Let's move that to the base scope. So that's no longer an add alternate. That's moved to the base scope. And then we said add alternate number three, slope granite curbs in lieu of bituminous concrete curbs. Let's change that to add alternate one. So that'll be in terms of this upcoming um, cost estimate round, that will be listed as add alternate number one. So those were the um, changes to the add alternate list. And then the VE list. So we have three columns here, accepted, possible, rejected. So um, I'll, I'll just I'll run through them. So when we last met, we said, okay, reduce the planting scope. We said, okay, let's reduce it by an appropriate amount. Let's come back to you all and kind of see what that looks like. So that's, that's I have that as possible, but I, I removed a, a dollar amount because we, we got to figure that out. But that's that's listed as possible. Reduced toilet room wainscot height from six to four feet. We rejected that, so that's rejected. 
re reduced ceramic tile wainscot height from six feet or seven feet to four feet throughout the quarters. That was accepted. That was the one where I, I think MBG had kind of already made that change leading into last building committee meeting. So that's that one. Reduced playground area by 15%. We said, let's go to tonight's meeting and show you guys what that looks like. Or, or Chris was going to coordinate with the landscape architect and understand if that could be achieved. So I ha we have that as possible. Uh, change terrazzo to resilient flooring at cafeteria and pour some tile at lobby. That was accepted. Um, so that that's shown as the, in the accepted column. Uh, change polished CMU to regular CMU where called out. That was rejected. Um, steel balusters in lieu of glass paneling at the main stair. That was rejected. Reduced chain link in ornamental fencing both by 15%. That was rejected, but we kind of said if we can reduce the playground area, that would naturally reduce the, the fence run around that area. Um, the other conversation had on this topic was besides the fencing around the playground area, there really isn't other fencing that is not needed, right? So that, that transitions from one elevation to a, a lower elevation where it's needed for safety and code purposes. That's essentially the other fences fence area. So we're not going to remove that. Um, now with, so, but we're going to, on future slides, we're going to talk about this topic and the playground area topic. I just want to run through all this. Um, change ceramic tile flooring and my thresholds of toilet rooms to epoxy flooring that was rejected. Um, and, and so some of these items are items that were created back in the schematic design cost estimate, not, not from like Josh's list or, or any other updated estimates. So for example, this one, synthetic rubber mulch instead of playground surfacing, uh, that was rejected. Uh, reduced playground equipment scope by 25%. We rejected that. Um, early site package for ledge removal, et cetera, that, that was accepted. We're obviously moving forward with that. Remove speech reinforcement system to make it a mobile and part of the FF and E package. We said, let's reject that. Doesn't uh, worth it. Keep it in the GC scope. Uh, remove exterior basketball court from GC scope. Rejected that. It makes more sense just to keep it there. Uh, change electrical feeders from copper to aluminum. We accepted that. And change millwork cubbies to metal lockers. Rejected that. So that's kind of the full list that encompasses VE items that were started by Colliers and MVG way back in schematic design, as well as added items through kind of the, the design review process with you all. So the, the ones, and Chris was, will kind of speak to this slide. So, so this slide here talks about VE number three playground area and VE number eight fencing reduction. So Chris, you want to take it away? Sure. So after our last meeting, I contacted our landscape architect and, and kind of put the urgency on your concerns about the possibility of you know, maybe saving some money, uh, not only short term the project, but the long term replacement. Um, so what they did was they went back and looked. Um, the sketch to the left is the, the layout that we've been carrying all along with the appropriately sized players, play structures, et cetera. And then... Um, through the process, the, the landscape architect kind of went through, did some design, uh, renovate or uh, revisions, et cetera, and revisited things. They were able to reduce the playground surface area by about 15%, maybe a little bit more, by relocating and adjusting some of the play structures. We didn't change the play structures. Those are still required based on the number of students and, and having ample structures for kids to play on. Um so what they do is they rearrange them in a fashion that were allowed them um, to reduce the surface area by about 15%. What that did in uh, as well would be it reduced the length of perimeter fencing around it by a little bit. So all in all, we were able to, to get the, um, the surfacing down as suggested by Josh and, and the committee's considerations without sacrificing the overall, um, you know, play area square footage for the amount of students that are going to be in there. So it's still comfortable. It still meets the minimum areas, but through some redesign of lo and relocation of structures, et cetera, um, they were able to reduce that down. So that'll save some money in the long run. That'll, that'll help with some of the concerns in future uh, resurfacing down the road. It also kind of reduces the amount of fencing around. So between the two, the one on the left is the, the site plan layout we've been carrying all along. 
The one on the right is the revised ones. So for example, the pre-K to the left, you can see it's tight to the parking exit. And by squeezing that down and making some adjustments, it provides a little bit more ample room between the play area and that Northwest parking area. The same thing with the uh, play area in the front of school. You can see it kind of condenses a little bit, a little bit uh, more room towards the playing fields, but it still meets all the requirements of uh, the district's needs, uh, the meetings that we had with Karen and the amount of students that are gonna be out there. So we're still in good shape, um, but I think this will help add to the 90% estimate cost as we go forward. Questions yeah, the only that? thing to add to this, I think I misspoke when I was kind of highlighting this, these two items. So besides the reduction of fence, linear footage of fencing, we talked about fencing type. So the the one, the other conversation that I think you guys wanted to pick back up on, on this whole topic is like right now we're showing ornamental fencing around these two playground areas. The idea being they're kind of out front of the school, uh, more aesthetically pleasing do we want to change them to chain link fence? I know design team wise, they prefer not to, but um, I think it's appropriate to have you guys decide one way or the other. Did, uh, Josh, so kick us up. <laughs> sure, um, I, but before I do, I um, did folks at, uh, did Karen and others at, at Maynard Public Schools have a chance to look at this ahead of time? Because I'd rather defer to them to to give their their take ahead of mine. So, no, yeah. I, I know K Karen and the landscape architect are due to meet. I think this week or next week. Do I have that right, Karen? We are. Yeah, we're meeting um, Thursday, I believe, yep. with um, preschool staff or a couple of preschool staff members, our physical therapist, um, and the and Kate Murray, the assistant principal. So. Um, this is the first time I've seen the layout, but we're meeting to talk about different structures and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah like so Chris mentioned, the idea is that they have a removed playground equipment, right, Chris? That's correct. Um, this just kind of was finalized last Friday. They sent me over the graphic today. So they did not have to remove any of the equipment. They've made some adjustments in the location to get the play areas a little bit more efficient to get them reduced with the extra that was there. But, you know, as I mentioned, this surface area, the square footage still accommodates the needs of the number of students that you're looking to put in there, Karen. And then we're, we're going to maintain the structures, obviously. Um, there are There is a sh uh, shade structure in each one as well, right? So for those hot days, there's a place for, you know, people to kind of get underneath. Um, so it doesn't do much other than reduces surface area. Yeah, so I think it looks great. Um, you know, I want to make sure that uh, the the school has an opportunity to go through the playground equipment, um, and I we do that too. It, it's an iterative process; it takes some time. Um, but hearing that you didn't, you did, you weren't required to compromise the actual playground design itself. You were no equipment was removed. It really just was making it a little more efficient. I like that a lot. Um, I think we've got you know, we picked up some great efficiencies here without any compromises that I can see. Um, real quick, and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, toss it over. I saw a hand come up. Um, on the ornamental fence, I took another look at the site plan. Uh, folks may remember my concern. I had a couple concerns, but one of them is just they they tend to get beaten up during snow removal. And I'm thinking what uh, that a compromise that we might uh, consider is that we leave the ornamental around the playground or the uh, preschool playground where I don't think you're gonna have the snow removal issues quite as much. My primary concern when I looked at this plan before was the stretch of sidewalk um, plan south on the, uh, the the older kids playground. Because I imagine that the snow is gonna to wanna to be pushed against that fence line. Um, so if we were to consider uh, chain link, we might there might be a hybrid option too. So just throwing that out there. Uh, Brian, you had your hand raised? I did. I was just curious, and I put my hand down now. Um, is, and I agree with Josh, it's a little more efficient. It doesn't look like we lost anything. Is it in the future if we needed it to be expandable? It is. Okay. It is. I, yeah. I'm just curious because I know across my email in the last week, this, and 
Greg's online, I'm sure this potential 40B project, which has implications for the future. So I'm just looking if in, you know, five years or something, we have uh, all of a sudden a lot more families with little kids in town. It's expandable. That was really what I was looking at. Yeah. I'm so, you saying. know, Brian, um, it, it's easily expandable. Obviously, you have to uh, you would remove some of the fence sections, bring in the mm -hmm. appropriate fill, prepare it and then pour the surface. Right. They would come in and joint the surface accordingly. Um, so more so in the larger play area than the smaller one, but the smaller one still has room for expansion. If we've okay. reduced it by 15 cent uh, percent, you could certainly easily expand it by 15 percent. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, so what do folks think about the chain link fence topic along this older student uh, playground area? Alexis, you got your hand raised? I do. Um, just because I have, I'm have i late to the game on this one. Do we have a picture of what the ornamental fencing looks like? I know what chain link fencing is going to look like, but I don't know what the ornamental looks like. I will pull up the rendering for you, Alexis. Kind of gives you a good um, a view. Just once I pull it up, I'll share it for you. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Brian, you have another comment? Are you muted? Yeah, Chris may be able to accommodate that. I know somebody, Josh, mentioned the chain link. And I think good quality black chain link doesn't look like the stereotypical 1975 chain link. Um, and I've seen some places that have that, which along with ornamental in certain places, it really doesn't have that negative look. So I didn't know if there were pictures of what some of the other uh, fencing options might be as we're exploring that, that's all. And it doesn't have to be for tonight. It could be just to share. Yeah, so Brian, you know, there are a number of different types of ornamental fence. A rendering, which I'm going to share right now, um, I'm disabled. I don't know if the host can yeah. enable me. Let's see, make co-host. But there are a number of different types of ornamental, and it would really be something, um, the type we usually specified is somewhat simplistic, but it's obviously uh, a little bit more um, ornamental than, than chain link, right? It's going to have a slightly different look. So if I share that, and let me know when you can see it. We can see it. I can see it. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, in this general area, you know, chain link is obviously a screen mesh. The black vinyl coated looks nice. That's what all the other fencing will likely be. Um, but ornamental is just going to give you a little bit more in a vertical baluster type with nice cross rails. Um, it just looks a little bit more, again, ornamental for the front of a building. It's typically what we've done. It comes in sections, so you probably have a post every eight feet. And then there's a section that gets bolted in. Repairing and replacement, you know, it's going to be a little bit more than chain link, but it's not something that's a difficult process, if you will. And it certainly would dress up the front of the building. That's typically why we do it in that area. Cost difference, it, there is a bit of, you know, a little bit of a cost difference. Um, I think by reducing some of the play area might help offset that. But again, it, it would be entirely up to the committee. So, Chris, is that just a like steel, you, you you got some horizontal top rail and some steel vertical balusters. That's all that is. For this, it is Phil, just because of the the Revit model didn't have a lot of options. You know when you're doing that. So, um, what I can do is put together a couple of uh, you know cuts from different types of ornamental. Typically, the ones we've done, you would have a bottom rail, and then two top rails that might be six or eight inches apart. And then vertical balusters, so it just dressed up a little bit better. Um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna take over. I just want to make yeah. sure they is something like this. What you're talking that's about? That's exactly it. That's typically what we've done in the past, right there. It's not one of the more expensive ones, but it is a nicer finish. You know, uh, 
Okay. All right, Mary, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to, um, I, I, and I, I guess, Chris, maybe you can, it doesn't sound like we've got the numbers right now, but the, the difference in cost between the, the ornamental and the, um, the chain link, I forget if we had that before, but I'd be all about um, doing, I think what Josh mentioned, which is having the chain link maybe right, you know, where it's along the walkway, but if we could do that like a hybrid with the, the ornamental, because you're right, just having it be nice from, you know, the front would be great. So maybe if we could get, could we get the cross differential without a lot of work? Yeah, I'm going to see if I can look it up right now while we're talking, Mary. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So you're right, Mary. We had, um, we had a number here, but I, I don't, it's don't, that's not applicable to this new modification we're talking about. So don't, don't even look at that. Yeah. Sorry. Honestly, the, the small area there, I'm going to go out and on a limb and say it's probably eight to $10,000 in savings at most. It's not a huge money issue. Um, I think this is more just about durability. Um, just my, my yeah. two cents. Yeah, Jerry. I will say the only other thing is, um, you know, looking at the option that you just showed, sometimes the other concern is the slats and how much distance there is between them. You can get like a tennis ball get, gets whipped around. Whereas on the field side, that wouldn't be a, the end of the world. If a kid throws a ball and it goes out in the field, not a big deal. But having that chain link on the um, on the, the driveway side might actually be a bit of a benefit, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Phil. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, just refresh me, my memory. Is this a four foot fence? This chain link we're talking about, four or six? Chris, I'll four. Front. Four feet. Four, four. I thought. Okay. All right. Yeah, four foot chain link, black, you know, coated chain link fence. I've done it in a lot of buildings, and it actually looks pretty good. And and for repairs later on, a lot cheaper. That's it. Otherwise, they both look nice. Thank you. Anthony. Well, actually, thank you. Just, just going to say what Jerry, I'm going to second Jerry. I think every, Jerry said everything, but uh, yeah, I agree. No, oh, you're muted. Mouse problem. Uh, people are used to seeing a chain link around a, a playground, you know, like that black vinyl chain link my neighbor put it in. It's like the nicest looking chain link fence I think I've ever seen. So I, I don't think people would blink about seeing that that black vinyl chain link fence around a playground. That's what all the parks are. I mean, it's, I don't think anybody would think twice. Okay. Um, okay, so what do we want to do, guys? <laughs> I do have um I do have some costs here. So per linear foot, uh the ornamental is about three times the cost you. of a uh, of a chain link. And uh, overall, Jennifer. Do we need a motion to reject the, or wait, accept the um, change? Is that what we need? Well, well, first we need to understand what, what is the change we want to make. So we, like, okay. we went into this conversation saying, do we want to not do any ornamental fencing around the two playground areas and make it all chain link? And, and so I don't know if people want to do that, or do we want to just focus on the playground that's out front of the school, the older student <laughs> playground area and make that chain link? So we got to figure out scope first. Okay. I mean, it sounds like people are saying that the chain link would be fine. Is is yep. sort of the shit I'm getting from folks. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. That almost sounds like a motion, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was asking. <laughs> so I make a motion that we accept the change to the chain link. I or is it reject the ornamental? Reject the ornamental at both playground areas? At both playground areas. I'll second it. Do, yeah. And then we also have to do one for, for lower decreasing the size, right? Or do we? The 15%? No. Well, I no. mean, it, I think, oh. well, let, let's, I said, you know, let's get a, in a, a vote of approval okay. for this, for this playground area reduction. Yes, let's do okay. that. And that will link to the fencing reduction. Okay. Okay, I'll do a roll call vote. And we're voting on the uh, motion for sticking with the uh, vinyl coated four foot ball chain link fence, not, um, I forget the other title. 
premium. Or, or, not, not ornamental, yeah. Or not ornamental, that's it. Uh, so by a roll call, Justin. Yes. Yes. Greg. Yes. Mary. Yes. Alexis. Yes. You. Brian. Yes. Mike Stevens. Yes. Karen. Yes. yes. Oh. Whoops. Sorry, Karen. <laughs> Boy, there must be two Karens here tonight. Jennifer. <laughs> yes. Or oh, the other Karen, I guess. Yeah, okay. Uh, Wayne. Yes. Thank you. I'm a yes. Mark Anderson. Mark here? No? He's here. He was. He was. I'm going to run by him anyway. Anthony? Yes. Thank you. Matthew? Yes. Nick? Oh, Nick's not here. Ken's not here. Josh? Yes. Okay, and that is it for voting members. Uh, what about Mark? Did Mark ever uh, reserve for Mark, Matthew? Okay, we're good. It passes. Yeah, that, yeah. Th thank you. Uh, the last motion we should get is um, your your approval on this playground area reduction, these two playground areas. Uh, Josh, Josh, you got your hand raised. Yeah. Yep. I was actually going to make a motion. Uh, I'll make a motion to reduce the playground dimensions as identified on the screen. As discussed, this would not reduce the uh, playground features themselves. And with the, I'd like to suggest that we add the, a condition that uh, should the staff at Green Meadow and Maynard Public Schools determine uh, through the course of working with the design team that the space is not sufficient, that they bring that back to the building committee uh, for further discussion. I know that's a lengthy motion. I don't think we need to repeat all of that, but. Is there a second on that? I nice can second brief? it. Good. Thank you, Mary. Uh, again, by a roll call. Uh, Justin. Yes. Uh, Greg. Yes. Mary. Yes. Alexis. Yes. Brian. Yes. Mike Stevens. Yes. Karen. Yes. The other Karen, Jennifer. Yes. Thank you. Wayne. Yes. I'm a yes. Mark Anderson. Yes. Thank you. Anthony. Yes. Matthew. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Nick and Josh. Yes. That's it for voting members. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, next slide here. Chris just wanted to show um, based off of the the approval to not do terrazzo in the cafeteria, what they're thinking about for flooring in the calf, uh, Chris? Yeah, so um, in lieu of the initially designed terrazzo, uh, one of the things we're looking at is a sheet good product, a, a linoleum, something of that nature. It's adhered to the floor, with numerous colors, patterns. Um, and so this kind of gives you a quick idea of, you know, maybe a large field with some perimeter uh, color changes. Susan's going to work out some some of the details, but um, it's very hygienic, easy to clean, maintain, um, and certainly at a lower cost than what we were originally hoping to put in as terrazzo. So this is one of the, the value engineering items that were discussed and uh, we're moving forward with. Josh? Real quick, uh, I know you, you guys are probably all over this, but um, I've learned over the years that curtain color selections are very limited. Um, so just food for thought, uh, we always take a hard look at how the uh, the curtain color might clash with colors that we're specifying for other materials. Not something we need to dig into here, but just something to think about. Gotcha. Yeah, and I'll be touching on that, um, Josh, in a little Great, bit. Thank you. One thing I'm just gonna if there are not any other questions or comments on this slide, I'm gonna go back to the site slide because the other site, the item that we wanted to touch on, and Chris, I'll let you take it away. I just wanna is the um the planting scope. So Chris, you wanna update them on kind of where that stands? Yeah. So that thanks, Phil. So one of the things that was discussed at the last um 
building committee meeting was the planting scope, reducing planting scope to save some money. There were some ideas about planting um, you know, long paths, planting beds that need to be mulch, weeded, et cetera, maintained on a regular basis. So brought that information over to the landscape architect. They in turn fully agree, you know, providing some of that around the immediate building would be nice, but outbound planting beds that need to be mulch maintained. Weeded um, certainly can be something that can be um, eliminated just, just due to the fact of the maintenance and save some money. Um, the thought would be to maybe put some of that money back into planting of trees. Uh, I believe Justin had mentioned, you know, trees are good, easy to maintain, appropriate. The planting beds, mulching beds just, you know, become a, a problematic thing. And that ties into our first meeting with the planning board um, a couple of weeks back in that one of the comments was, in fact, you know, we are removing a certain amount of trees on site. What can we do to get that one to one ratio back? It's going to be very, very difficult to get that. But we we'd indicate we'd look at how to get close. So by removing some of these uh, mulch planting beds, we could use that money to put back into the trees and kind of satisfy not only the planning board, but the tree committee also made those comments, you know, about, you know, replenishing the trees that we're taking out. We won't get there one-to-one. -one. That's an awful lot, but we can certainly get close by managing how we do that with either the size of trees, types of trees, and the quantity in lieu of these planting beds. So that's one of the things we're really taking a look at now that'll help clean up the site, make it easier to maintain by, by just putting in mowed areas um, still provides nice green space, but I think uh, overall it, it'll just be maintained a lot easier. Um, you know, maintenance on school departments is is really difficult these years, as we know. So that's what we're currently taking a look at. Anybody have any questions on it? Well, so Chris, I'll just so I think what we want to mm -hmm. do is uh, let's come back to them showing kind of the before and after what planting beds got removed you know what i mean let's let's kind of yeah. close this out appropriately um what trees were added and so on and so on absolutely okay so that's the planting scope uh we talked about the flooring there okay so that's that's ve items um Next agenda item, review and vote on finance subcommittee members and dollar amount authorization of proposal change order. So now that we were in construction, it's just the early site package, but it's it's a construction process and project nonetheless. Um, it's when we like to set up a finance subcommittee to make sure we have a process in place to keep the construction project moving you know, efficiently and in a timely manner. Because what happens during construction projects is you get proposal change orders from contractors and you got to review them in a quick time manner. You got to, you know, deem them a fair and appropriate in a quick time manner and get owner approval on them in a quick time manner. And um, it's easier to um, get together with a smaller group of people uh, than it is a bigger group of people. So what we typically do as we're entering into a con the construction phase of our projects is we seek the building committee's approval to set up a finance subcommittee. Um, and the idea is they meet as needed. Um, once the main project gets going, that might, the meeting schedule for the finance subcommittee, if, if you all approve the idea of a finance subcommittee, might turn into a scheduled thing. But for the early site package, it would be kind of as, neat, as needed basis. Mm -hmm. And the idea would be, yeah, if we get or as we get proposal change orders from the GC, it would be connected with connecting with the finance subcommittee members. They would still be public meetings, um, but we'd be able to schedule those in a more timely manner than than the full building committee. Um, they would be virtual, just like these are. Um, and so so that's this topic. Uh, so, the, again, the idea is a small group of people, uh, Colliers and MDG would present to them the proposal change orders that are on the table by the contractor, the idea would be um, it's not until we'd feel that they are appropriate change orders to even be reviewed that we would, we would hold off on setting up the finance subcommittee until then meeting until then. But 
uh, once that initial review process happens and, and the we deem the PCOs uh, appropriate and fairly priced, that's when we would uh, set up a, a finance subcommittee meeting to seek that group's approval. And the idea would be, if you are all good with having a finance subcommittee, the next kind of approval that you would give upon that finance subcommittee is um, a dollar amount authorization on uh, each individual proposal change order. So on the side here, I kind of list out what we typically see on our school projects for finance subcommittee members. It would be, you know, the superintendent of schools, the district's business manager, building committee chair, town administrator, and then like one or two other uh, building committee members is what we kind of see, generally speaking, across the board. Uh, meeting format, we can stick with virtual, just like we have our, our monthly building committee meetings. We would still post them publicly. It's still taxpayer money. Uh, so a 48 hour public notice, all, all that um, meeting frequency as needed. But again, once the main project gets kicked off, potentially that, that changes to, you know, in between each of our monthly building committee meetings, we can figure it out when we get there. But but for right now, as needed. Um, and what we see typically uh, for a dollar uh, limit, if you will, per proposal change order is 50K. Um, but that, you know, whatever, whatever that building committee members feel comfortable with. But that's that's this agenda item. Um, any questions on any of that before we seek a motion or talk? Yeah, about Phil. Yeah, Phil, yep. uh, just, just a quick question. Um, and, and you and I have already talked about this, but what I didn't clarify in my own head. So what I heard you just say now, let's say there's six or seven members of this finance subcommittee. Uh, and we were to vote and authorize something for 50000 So that's done and authorized, right? Then we would bring it to the full committee at the next full committee meeting. And yeah, basically, the record. And, and, for, for the record, and review it. Yep. But we're not yep. looking for the full committee to vote the approval. The approval has already been done, right? Correct. Yes. Correct. Right. And, and the other thing I want to add is, in the event proposal change orders and the approval of them actually falls conveniently with a scheduled building committee meeting, yeah. we would we would do it with you all. Like it, this is honestly just like in those, <laughs> and they're not random, unfortunately. In those occasions where you know we have our building committee meeting tonight, and and we find out you know tomorrow is when we get done reviewing. PCO number one, and we realize, yeah, this is fair. We let's set up a finance subcommittee meeting to get it approved. Um, it's for those okay occasions where, like, we're not meeting with you guys for another month. You know what I mean? That, that's the idea behind it. Yeah. The other the other thing I would suggest, I think, uh, might be that we would have possibly seven members, because even though it's quicker to get you know these seven people together based upon jobs and where people are at a given point in time, maybe they can't dial into a Zoom meeting. But at least if out of the seven, we may most all the time at least have five. Because uh, if you go with five, then you might be down to three. I, you know, representing a 21 member committee, my preference would be to have, go for seven on this subcommittee, you know, with the hopes that we can always have five when we, when we call a, a meeting. That's my just a suggestion. Go ahead, Mary. No, do, do you have thoughts on school committee? I mean, the school building committee members. I mean, I've got a couple of thoughts. I didn't know if maybe Josh and Nick, I'm thinking, are really good people to. I'm just thinking people that are really into the numbers, but I don't yeah. even know if sure. they'd be amenable or if, you know, what expertise that you're looking for, but it seems like they would. They That's exactly. Yes, I, I've thought of Josh. I thought of Nick. I've thought of Justin. <laughs> Mark is in the industry. Mark also. Yeah. Matt, Matt's in the industry. So no, I mean we have a, a good group to select from for sure. Yeah. So. Well, we can get Nick because Nick isn't here tonight. I so know. That, that, that's <laughs> an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I nominate all those people. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. It's too many, Very unfortunately. Good. But yeah, I guess out of those who who wants to step up and be part of it, or who has the time too, because it's yet another meeting. But like you, like you say, Phil, it's not, you know, a lot of meetings, but it sounds like it could be. Um, but I think yeah, it's it, brilliant. I think it makes a lot of sense. Well, it, it, it really does, because, you know, think of the other working groups we've got. 
uh, you know, you keep the working group below a, a quorum. So the working groups, we don't always publicize those meetings. We don't have to do that. But this we do. But because we're here, we're, we're committing, uh, you know, town, you know, town resident taxpayer funds. But um, I, you know, we haven't had a lot of the subcommittee meetings, you know, the, the working group meetings either. We have them this sporadic. There may be a time when you've got a meeting and then all of a sudden a week later, wow, oh, she's got to have another one. Uh, but there'll be enough notification. And if we have at least seven members, um, I would suggest we could probably always at least have five in attendance. Just, just my thought. Josh, you get your hand up. Yeah, um, so I'm happy to, uh, to help out and volunteer for this if folks would, uh, would like. The other thing I, I might point out is that um, I think we've got a great building committee here with a lot of people with varied experiences. So just because an individual isn't on this group doesn't mean that we wouldn't call upon their professional expertise mm -hmm. to weigh in on a potential change order. Um, you know, I think of not not to, to pigeonhole you, Justin, into one area, but I think of like soils, for example, um, and, you know, site work might be an area that Justin is really um, proficient on. And if he is, you know, if he's on the, this group, great, then he's there. But if he's not, there's nothing that would preclude us from reaching out to him mm -hmm. and asking him to take a look and give his opinion on it. And that's just one example. Yep. Correct. So you say Justin knows, Justin knows dirt. That's good. That's good. That's what I get out of that anyway. I'm sure, like, like myself, Justin is a jack of, of many trades. So yes. he, he's yes. required to know a, a fair amount about a lot of things. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, Justin may want to choose to raise his hand and volunteer to get on this group, or uh, to your point, Josh, uh, well taken, uh, Justin could be a resource that, uh, that the rest of the group could reach out to uh, for clarification on some issues if that's appropriate, because you know, everybody's busy, and now Justin's up to his eyeballs in work as it is on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so right and honestly, Jerry, if, if people aren't, you know, ready to kind of finalize this decision tonight it, it can happen at the next building committee meeting it, it right. it's okay i just I, I can tell people aren't jumping to raise the hand <laughs> if people oh, are yeah. interested they just email jerry and then he could send out a list of who the people are yeah it, it honestly timeline wise it's not the end of the world if this doesn't get you know you know finalized and voted on until the next building committee meeting i see a couple of hands but i see people raising their hands so all right uh brian I was going to say, I think this is a pretty standard operating procedures for school building projects. I don't know why we wouldn't just move ahead. You've got a list of appropriate people. I think you have people that are interested. I would just check it off the list and set it up so that if if and when you need it, it's ready to roll. Yep. That's my two cents. Mark? Yeah, Phil, I, I don't I don't mind doing it. I, you know, Jerry, I appreciate you being cognizant of the fact that, we, you know, trying to pull a group like this together – on a whim here or there to approve some change orders. It's going to be to prove difficult at times. As long as we've got a flexible group that can try and get together, I think we'll be all right. So if we're going to move forward like that. I'm happy to step forward and, and jump on this. I uh, just want to make sure everybody, all members included, understand kind of the expectation is that it's going to be some fire drills to get these approved so we don't delay the contractor. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Justin. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm glad you guys volunteer me. But for the most part, I actually am running a multi-million dollar project without a committee. So I do all those change orders. So I actually would prefer not to be part of this unless I'm needed. So if we do not have enough people, this is something I do literally 52 times a day. It's not a big deal for me or a heavy lift. But I know that um, a lot of members aren't always on some of these subcommittees. I think it's something that you should learn if you don't know. Um, the $50,000 limit, you'd be surprised how many times we're going to crest that and it's going to come to the full committee. Um, change orders of this magnitude will most likely crest that 50 K I'm here if you need me, but I, uh, I would love to see others volunteer for something like this. So I mean, we got, we got this list here. Um, I think, you know, we got Josh, we got Mark. And Nick. And oh, we're just, <laughs> that's right. We said Nick's in. That's what you got from that yeah, coming. No, I'm, 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 I'm making note of that, Mary, that you 
nominated and Nick I nominated. in his absence. Thank he, you. He'll do it. So that, that's and seven, I, Jerry. Right. But I'd also, um, can we yeah. make made aware of the, can you guys send out a note when, because the, they have to be 48 hours in advance anyway. So can the rest of us at least know when the meeting is so we can be there yeah. and just keep our mouth shut? Yeah. Uh, that would be great. Yeah. Do you want me to make a motion or should we wait until Nick comes back the next meeting? <laughs> No, I think we can do it because I think Nick will accept it. And if he doesn't, yeah. we'll get somebody else. Yeah. And we'll deal with him later. Um, okay. I make a motion yeah. that we create the finance subcommittee um, uh, made up of superintendent of schools, the district business manager, the school building committee chair, town administrator, Mark Anderson, Josh Morse, Nick Kane, with the uh, a limit of $50,000 per proposal change order. Is that sufficient? Excellent. Yep. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, by a roll call, uh, Justin. Yay. Uh, Greg. Yep. Mary. Yes. Alexis. Yes. Brian. Yes. Mike Stevens. Yes. Karen. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Wayne. Yes. Thank you. I mean, yes. Mark Anderson. Yes. Anthony. Yes. Matthew. Yes. Thank you. Nick and Josh. Yes. I know he's here. Josh is attending two meetings yes. at the same time. Okay. Thank you, Josh. We're yep. good. That's unanimous. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, next agenda item design update, Chris. Okay, um, so a lot of things you've heard about, but I'll just go through them quickly. So we've had our Planning Board and Conservation Commission meetings. Um, we also received peer review comments from their, the board's peer reviewers. Our design team members have reviewed those comments and submitted uh, their responses including uh, as recently as I think Friday, we got the tree committee's comments. So all those are back with the planning and conservation boards. They're reviewing them. Um, we are hoping to set up a meeting with the peer reviewers in the next week or so, just to make sure there's no other additional questions and everybody's on the same page. We have all the information so that when we meet with planning and conservation at the beginning of September, we can kind of get that ironed out. And while Hopefully we can get it closed. Probably not. We'll definitely get it closed before the end of September. 60% um, CD review comments and responses. So we received our MSBA comments last Wednesday. Again, very minimal. A majority of it is things like um, a spec section. Uh, this particular spec section does not have three uh, equal products or manufacturers. Please provide in the next submission. So a lot of it's like that. There was nothing egregious that was missing. I think we've hit it all. They're just looking to fill in some of the blanks of information they, they're hoping to see. So that's good news. We will get those out this uh, over the next week or so um, and then go from there. We received the commissioning envelope and MEP systems review comments. Uh, we're providing responses to that. There's again, nothing um, out of the realm of what we would expect. A lot of it's just gonna be suggestions, comments, understanding uh, what we're providing um, to meet the, the individual codes, operating systems, et cetera. And then we did receive some comments from some of the SBC members. So Ken News Neuhauser um, submitted some, Matt Johan. Uh, we had Nick's from a previous submission. Um, and this submission as well. And we had some from Josh in the previous submission. So we're going through those. Um, I provided responses to Matt. We ended up having a meeting with Matt, just go over them. Um, and I'll share some of that information with you. A lot of it was code related, Matt's expertise and thing, seeing things from the projects he manages, all good information. Uh, a majority of it, if not all of it is expected to be in the 90%, 100%. It just wasn't at that stage yet. Um, I think I mentioned this previously where our documents have to follow the MSBA checklist parameters. Um, so some information that 
the design professionals that we have on the committee would would want to see or look for uh, may not have been in the documents yet, but they will be. So that was all good. I know that one of the, the big things with Matt was egress out of the pre-K. We did share a plan with him um, showing how we've met all those requirements, and we can share that with you as well in one of the upcoming slides. Um, I'm in the process of responding to Nick's comments. We'll get those out to him. And then we do have, as a follow-up meeting listed below, we have a working group meeting this Thursday. We're hoping to share some of the uh, colors for the exterior elevations, a couple of color schemes, and maybe touch on some discussions about some of the uh, additional comments, at least from Ken's point, because I know he's on vacation and unable to attend tonight. So we're continuing that process. We do expect to see some more at the 90%. Um, but as always, happy to have them, happy to have an extra set of eyes and um, explain some of the process. Um, reviewing the SBC VE items, we've gone through that, talked about our approach and got some good information on, on how we're going. We're gonna continue to work that way. Uh, we're working towards the MSBA 90% CDs, coordination in-house with our various uh, engineering firms and consultants, going through the clash detection that Revit provides, always very helpful in, in seeing how things uh, can be caught ahead of time. And then our document updates based on these meetings, MSBA comments, and just getting that final, you know, 40 to, you know, 35 to 40% information going for the next, uh, the next sessions with MSBA and, and, and whatnot. So some of the follow-up meetings we had, uh, and by me, my interior design team met with Karen and her vice principal, um, I believe it was last week, Karen, maybe the week before, uh, to start talking about the color schemes of school, the intent, the, you know, the vision that Karen and her people would have for that. And I'm going to share some of the, the results of that with you uh, in the upcoming slides. They are not final. They still have to be vetted and reviewed again with Karen. Um, but it kind of gives you an idea of how things are starting to pull together. We're having that working group meeting uh, this Thursday. Again, we're gonna talk about the exterior elevations. I'm also gonna have my mechanical engineer on. I know Ken has some questions about some of the systems. Again, just to kind of bring everybody to date, where we are, how the systems are unfolding, et cetera. And then the last piece that we're looking to do in the next week or two, probably uh, more likely after the holidays, is a final meeting with public safety. Um, Chief Lawless, Chief Noble, Justin and the building inspector uh, try to get everybody in the same group so that everybody's sharing the same ideas and understanding the different commitments and where they're coming from. And it's really just to do that final review of the safety aspect of the building, um, the security, right? From a fire standpoint, making sure the site's accessible and everything that goes along with that. Um, the building inspector, um, we want to make sure he understands that these are the codes we're permitting to and, and just give him a rundown of how we're addressing the building code, et cetera. And then with Justin, again, you know, big information um, provider from the start of the project, want to make sure he's up to date and, and has the ear and the pulse of the town. So that's all coming up um, and we'll continue to work through that. We will probably have another working group meeting later on towards the 90% submission as we come up with more uh, things to share and then we'll ultimately share with this committee. Um, questions on the update. Things are going well, progressing along, we're on schedule, I think we're in good shape. Um, the plan, this is the plan we shared with uh, Matt. We had it initially with the, the previous meeting, but one of the comments that Matt had was his concern about a secondary egress from the upper right pre-K room back out into the corridor. Our initial, uh, egress was through that door that Phil's pointing to, and then one coming through the middle pre-K room and then back out to the corridor. Matt had a question about the validity of that. While it is valid, we decided to take it a step further and provide egress through the pre-Ks down, and there's, an, there's gonna be an egress door going out into the corridor and directly out. That egress door will have the appropriate hardware to get out of the classroom. It will not have hardware to get into the classroom as part of the safety feature. So it is strictly there for the egress component of the building. Everything else kind of maintains the same. We've got exit signs where they are, um, where the egress points will be shown. We will, as part of our project uh, closeout, 
be providing egress signage or these types of documents for each classroom. Um, they are required, just like you would find in the hotel rooms on the back of the door. In case of a fire, here's your path of egress. So we'll provide that to Karen and her staff so she can hang them and hand them out in the classrooms. Uh, we'll make sure they're appropriate. They'll be color-coded uh, with the red lines and everything showing the egress, et cetera. So um, this worked out well. It meets the requirements of the code. I think Matt was good with it. I don't know if you have anything else to add, Matt, about our meeting. Uh, no, I, I really appreciate the time you guys put into all this. You gave me detailed responses in writing and then took the time to meet with me. And I'm I'm comfortable with, with pretty much everything that we've talked about. So it was good. Okay, great. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad to hear it. So um, on to the last couple of slides. Susan Taylor, who I think uh, you've met, she'll be joining our committee meetings uh, in the coming future, spoke with Karen about some of the, the visions for the school, colors, and things of that nature. And so this is kind of a, a rendering of the front uh, lobby area. So one of the things she's done, you can see the glass rail kind of provides a nice vision, clear views into the cafetoria, not only above, but below. Um, there's a mural on the left-hand side. We've done these in a number of our elementary schools. They're a nice feature, not a huge cost when you talk about replacing paint, tile, et cetera. But one of her ideas was, and I don't know if she shared it with you, Karen, but um, Green Meadow School. So you've got a green meadow with some, mm -hmm. some nice age-appropriate uh, trees and shrubs and, and animals and things. Kind of really lends to the, um, the feel of the school. If it's something you don't like, we can certainly take it out. But things we're doing to really make the school feel home to the kids, right, at a young age group. Um, but it gives you a feel of the vision, the tile to four feet, some color. There will be a display that has, it's programmable. We typically tie it into the BMS system to show, you know, utility savings, weather. It can be used for school announcements. Hey, you know, school dismissal at noon due to weather, things of that nature, right? Lunch menus, anything that you can imagine. Uh, Karen and her staff will have full control. If you go to the next slide. Hey, Josh, you got a question? Oh, oh yes, sorry. Josh. No, no worries, Chris. Uh, quick question. So on the mural, I love it. Um, are you thinking of vinyl graphic or are you thinking mosaic tile? Not tile. Oh, okay. It'll All be right. something that gets printed almost like a, a wallpaper yep. type material. Very good and inexpensive. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking, you know, in the future, if they want to change it up, they have that opportunity. Awesome. Thank you. Exactly. Yep. You're welcome. All right. So the next uh, view is a vision down the pre-K or any typical quarter, if you quarter, if you will, kind of gives you a sense of how the colors, while these may not be finalized, just their softer colors, they'll be age appropriate. Um, lighting and floor finishes at the classroom nodes. So you'll notice on either side, there'll be doors into the classrooms or signage. So as kids are coming down that classroom, they see this change in floor, a change in lighting. Hey, I'm here, I'm at so-and-so's room, et cetera. So it's not just continuing down and kind of looking for things. And it breaks up the corridors, you know, kind of reduces the scale for the young children. We're showing the wood cubbies, half height, counter areas on top for kids to put backpacks or things that, you know, while they're getting their stuff out of their cubbies. There's vision lights into the classrooms that provides a sharing of natural daylight to and from and allows a nice visual um, review of what's going on inside the room as, let's say, Karen and her staff or people are coming down the corridor um, or people want to see what's going on outside if, if there's things happening. Also down the way you can see that on the walls, there's some um, display cabinets and things of that nature. So the corridors will be typically either sheet vinyl or VCT type products, easily maintained, cleaned, et cetera, and very cost efficient um, due to its durability and maintenance. Okay, um, the last one we have is a typical classroom. Again, they're showing some soft colors, plenty of storage, two sinks, uh, storage area to the right of things for lateral files and things of that nature. Uh, pendant lighting will allow both down lighting and up lighting, reflective lighting to the ceiling, making them very bright with without overly having hot spots below. The furniture will typically be on lockable casters, uh, very lightweight, movable, very easily arranged in different configurations, 
for the various uh, teachers, depending on how they want to teach or the, the semester that they're in. Um, and the colors will be appropriate to uh, the grade structures as well. So those will all be reviewed. Um, we'll get into more so the, the wall paint finish colors um, in the near future. Um, the furniture will come about a year prior to occupancy where our furniture consultant will take a look at the color schemes that are currently planned and then sit down with the district staff to go through and, and select the appropriate furniture with the appropriate color trims, chair colors, et cetera, uh, not only for students, but also for staff. Um, you've seen the, the cafetorium. Can we go back to that, Phil? Yep. If you don't mind. Thank you. So one of the things Josh mentioned earlier and I want to touch on, which is, is very appropriate, is the stage colors, right, the curtains, those are going to be coordinated with everything that goes into the space. Uh, the acoustical panels that may have some fun patterns on the walls that you see around the perimeter. Um, the, the stage front is going to be a nice wood, kind of dress up that front proscenium opening. We will go over the color of the curtains. It'll be in conjunction with the furniture, the flooring, the paint, everything that goes with it. So throughout the building, Susan's actually very good. For those of you who've been through, um, you know, Marlboro, which was more of the principal's idea, but even so at Ludlow, you could see how everything kind of tied together from wing to wing, floor to floor, community space, teaching space, administration space, to make it a holistic type design, um, but yet identify the different features throughout, whether it be the upper grade classrooms, the pre-K versus K, the public spaces versus administration spaces and that. So um, she's very thoughtful about going through that. Now that she's met with Karen once, she's going to pull together some things. She shared some of these with me today. Uh, I think she's on the right path. But if anybody's got some comments, would like to weigh in, by all means, always looking for some input. Okay, any other questions or comments on any of the design update? Okay, next agenda item would be new or other business. Anybody have any new updated business? I don't have anything on my list. I think okay. I'm good there. So next meeting date, we're showing um, September 30th. Does that work for folks? Yeah. September 30th. Yep. I don't hear any rebuttals. Sound like the 30th works. Yeah. Um, I don't see that we have any guests uh, also in the meeting room at this time. Nope. So I will not address any uh, outside visitors. Um, anything else? That's it for us. Uh, good. I would certainly entertain one of the more interesting uh, motions of the of each meeting seat. I make agenda. A motion that we adjourn. Thank you, Mary. Second on that? I will second Mary's motion. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, via roll call. Justin. Yay. Craig. He is so good. Craig, please. All right. Mary. Yes. Alexis. Yes. Brian. Yes. Mike Stevens. Mike leaves? Might have. Uh, Karen? Yes. Uh, Jennifer? Yes. Wayne? Yes. Thank you. I mean, yes. Mark? Yes. Anthony? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Matthew? Stevens, I'm a yes. Okay, thanks, Mike. Yes. Thank you. And Nick, Nick, Josh. Yes. Perfect. 
And who else do we have on tonight? We had uh, Nathaniel. Is Nathaniel still on? Nathaniel Dwyer, Finance Committee, was on here. I'm here. Oh, good. Nathaniel, you are a non-voting member, but I would certainly ask, would you like to adjourn this meeting? I would, thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Um, and Tony Savard, are you still on? I am. Ah, good. Would you like to end the meeting? Sure. I, that's a yes with me. All right. Perfect. That's unanimous from everybody here. I think we're done, folks.